Good morning, everyone. Very nice to see you all today and a very warm welcome to you. Um, this evening's service um, is at six o'clock and we have a communion service as well. Um, Bible study this week on Tuesday um, at 7.15, we'll be looking at Psalm 55, but on Wednesday at 11 o'clock, Psalm 23. Now, in the link, there is a slight error. Wednesday's um, Bible study isn't at 10 o'clock. It's a new time now. It's at 11. Excuse me, 11 o'clock. <coughs> And prayer meeting is on Wednesday at 7.15. On Wednesday and Thursday, the usual Dementia Day Clubs meet. And on the 21st of October, Siloam Ladies Bible Study meet and Maureen Fletcher from Crofty is the speaker. And Ladies Thirty next meet on Monday the 23rd of October. And let's remember the Sketty Food Bank, um, and it's our charity of the year now, and there's always great need there, so your gifts are very welcome indeed. And the other thing to remember is the Romanian Aid Foundation, that's still ongoing and all these items here are very welcome. If you can bring anything, any of those, they would be gratefully received. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I've been in touch with Pam, uh, David Allen's um, wife, and he's making slow but good progress, as is Christine, um, I understand, is uh, making uh, slow but good progress, going in the right direction. Good to see you all. Um, we've got one or two people with us who don't normally worship with us. A very special welcome um, to you. So shall we begin <coughs> with a word of prayer? Let us pray together. Lord, we give thanks for this beautiful morning. We give thanks to you that we have a beautiful Saviour. He is altogether lovely, your word says. And it's our privilege to worship you in his precious name. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that as we worship you, that you, through your Spirit, will bless every aspect of our worship and allow us to clearly see Jesus. For we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, our uh, first hymn, therefore, you are the word of God the Father. Thank you, Morrison.
you very much indeed. Well, Harris, um, do you stop? Appreciate. Um, Max, this hair off your shirt. If you were the address of the meeting. This morning's reading is taken from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after. The guests have had too much to drink. But you have served the best, saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana and Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Oh, Diolch am Uriam Harris, thank you for leading us in the reading of God's word. So it's our privilege now to approach God's throne with our prayers. So shall we do that? Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a privilege indeed to be able to approach your throne, knowing that you don't reject us. Indeed, you welcome us. You welcome us with open arms. We have sinned against you, Lord. From the beginning, we have sinned against you. We have chosen to rebel, to go our own way. Yet, we give thanks to you that your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord, and to each and every one of us. You love us with an everlasting love. Even though we have sinned against you, you continue with your great love for us. And indeed, you have given us the most precious gift of all, the gift of a saviour, the gift of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who indeed chose to leave his throne and chose indeed to take our sins to the cross of Calvary and offered the perfect sacrifice once for all. And we give thanks to you that he continues in his ministry to us and for us. Because your word says he lives to intercede for us. And why does he live? Or how does he live to intercede for us? Because he conquered death itself. And you have given us the most wonderful hope. The most wonderful promise. That if we are one with him in his death. We are also one with him in his resurrection. Oh what a glorious hope. What a glorious God, what a glorious Saviour, and what a glorious future we have in his precious name. Lord, please help us through your Spirit to ponder upon these things. 
to meditate upon these things, to realize anew the extent of your great love for us. Remind us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter how powerful the enemy, no, no matter how powerful the weapons he has at his disposal, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that is truly amazing. Truly amazing. And we give thanks and praise to you. And help us through your spirit to do that in a way that is pleasing to you. Let all that we do this morning bring glory to your name. And not just this morning, but in our lives from day to day. In our going out and our coming in. In all the things that we are involved in. Help us to bring glory to your name. Help us to be a light and help us to be salt amongst the people that we involve ourselves with. Yes, Lord, bless each and every one of us for your glory. Bless the Lord and bless your church everywhere. Especially we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. Lord, help us to remember them, to feel a deep compassion for them. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless not only them, but those that persecute as well. Because your word tells us to do that. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless those people that we have mentioned this morning and others indeed that continue um, in a state of ill health, Lord. You know who they are. And there are many other names mentioned in our hearts this morning, I'm sure. And therefore, Lord, we bring those people to you asking that you would extend your arm and that you would touch each and every one of them. And Lord, we pray for our country. We know that there are so many concerns, so many worries regarding the immediate future and indeed the long-term future, not only in our country, but globally as well. And therefore we ask that you would bless and guide those that govern in our country and indeed in all the countries of the world. You, our sovereign God, our compassionate God, our loving God, we commit all these things, all these things to you. And again, we ask your forgiveness for all our sins. These things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us when praying to offer this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, shall we sing? our second hymn, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Thank you very much for this.
church indeed, dear friends. A beautiful hymn indeed, I'm sure you would agree. Well, this morning we've reached the third um, sermon in our series, Strength to Strength. And we're focusing this morning <coughs> on the words, and thank you again, Harris, for reading uh, the words um, we find um, in, <coughs> in, in the reading. Um, can you tell me which one it is, which verse it is? Seven, eight, and, uh, seven, eight. Verses 7 and 8. There we are. Thank you very much indeed. I was just testing. Are you <laughs> Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And there we have it. Isn't it? Seven and eight. Uh, there, that's verse, was I said, verses 7 and 8. Jesus, thankfully, is more than willing, isn't he, to be involved in and bless every situation in our lives, every situation. Sometimes, according to his perfect sovereignty and grace, he extends an invitation. John, the Baptist's disciples, asked Jesus, Rabbi or Rabbi, where are you staying? He said, come and you will see. To Philip and Matthew, he said simply, follow me. Another invitation he graciously extended. In Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Another invitation, and sometimes he even invites himself, doesn't he? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house tonight. He invited himself. But we often see Jesus waiting to be invited, don't we? Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus waiting to be invited. And the two on the road to Emmaus, I love this, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Jesus receiving an invitation and accepting it. And here Jesus was invited to a wedding. But the wine, of course, as we know, had run out. Now, even though it was extremely embarrassing, as they say, worse things happen at sea. Don't they? Yes. Um, in the final analysis, worse things happen at sea. But Jesus used this situation to reveal his glory and everyone was blessed now in the old testament weddings and abundant wine symbolize the age of fulfillment and restoration as bruce mill puts it the new wine of the kingdom brought by jesus contrasts with the old wine of judaism or as Leon Morris puts it, Jesus changes the water of Judaism into the wine of Christianity. Christianity fulfilling the promises, if you like, of the Old Testament. And Whittaker, Rodney Whittaker, Jesus himself is the good wine 
that has been kept back until now. And we know that wine was used to purify impure water. Um, it was used as medicine, if you remember. Um, didn't Paul say to Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach? And the, um, what was it now, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, he poured oil and wine on the wounds, didn't he? Oil, uh, oil and wine on the wounds, uh, and indeed to aid celebration. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we um, read this verse in chapter 9. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. And doesn't the psalmist speak of the wine that gladdens the heart of man? So the wine represents all these things, doesn't it? Fulfillment, restoration, um, something that purifies the impure medicine um, and uh, a means to assist joy and celebration and in a spiritual sense I would like to ask this question have we run out of wine have we run out of wine are our spiritual stomachs in pain have we open wounds as a, a result of the enemy's attacks? Is the Christian church failing to portray the supremacy of Jesus, the one who fulfilled all righteousness and who can restore sinners into a right relationship with God? Have we lost our gladness and joy? I like what J.C. Ryle says, the Christian who walks the earth with a face as miserable as if he was attending a funeral does injury to the cause of the gospel. It is a positive misfortune to Christianity when a Christian cannot smile. That's what um, J.C. Ryle says. Well, if we have run out of wine, well, doesn't Mary give us the best possible advice? Do whatever he tells you, isn't it? Isn't that the best possible advice? Do whatever Jesus tells you. And what did Jesus tell the servants to do? Well, three things, three things specifically, and it's those three things I'd like to concentrate on just for the next few minutes. Fill, draw, and take, isn't it? Fill, draw, and take. So let's start with the first of those, fill, fill. Fill the jars with water. That was his advice. So they filled them to the brim. Now if I was in the position of the servants, I'd be thinking to myself, well, hang on now. We've run out of wine, not water. Now, there's still plenty of ceremonial uh, water here. It's wine we need. Lord, not so much water, but his command was, fill the jars with water. Now, despite the probable confusion, what did they do? So they filled them to the brim. So they filled them to the brim. Even though they probably didn't understand what was going on, even though there was confusion, they trusted his wisdom. 
and indeed they trusted his power. They trusted his sovereignty. And they filled these jars to the brim. You couldn't have put another drop in without it overflowing. There's always a danger, isn't there, of rendering to Jesus only partial obedience. But his demand is that we obey him fully. This is what the servants did. And we, you and I, his servants, should do the same. Obey him fully, not partially. But at the same time, dear friends, it's important, how can I put it, that we don't apply more holiness to ourselves than Jesus did to himself. Does that make sense? And I think what has happened in the Christian church, we've made up a little bit like the Pharisees. We've made up additional rules that Jesus simply doesn't expect and doesn't demand. It's important that we don't apply undue holiness try to make ourselves more holy than the king of holiness himself, if that makes any sense at all. You see, sometimes we can become too obsessed with what people think, with what people think. I think that's a little bit of a, of a scourge of today's politicians, isn't it? How we come over, how we look, how we are portrayed in the media. It seems as if there's an obsession now with political party leaders to be on good terms with the Rupert Murdochs and so on and so forth of this world because they, they control how we're portrayed, right? And it's a very dangerous thing, and I'm not going to go on about that. But there is this concern, um, too much of a concern, on the part of Christians especially, what will people think? What will people think? We mustn't do this just in case people get the wrong idea or think badly. Sometimes the Christian is called to do what society regards as the wrong thing. Jesus did. Jesus did things that went against the expectations, the man-made rules society had made up. One example, surely, is when he spoke to the woman, the Samaritan woman, at Jacob's well. We are clearly told that his disciples who had gone shopping were surprised, astonished, that he was talking to a woman on his own, a Samaritan woman. Yet, what mattered to Jesus was that he was speaking to a soul in need. Oh, look at him. Look at him um, eating with sinners, notorious sinners, publicans, uh, and so on and so forth. Look at him going to stay in Zacchaeus' house of all people. You know, nobody was more despised than Zacchaeus. I honestly don't think Jesus did these things to wind people up. I honestly don't think that when his disciples went shopping, when he was by Jacob's well, oh, what can I do now to wind 
those disciples up, or those people in Jericho, or wherever. He didn't invite himself to Zacchaeus' his house to wind everybody up. He invited himself to Zacchaeus' his house. He spoke to the woman on his own at Jacob's well because it was the right thing to do. Because they were souls in need. And how terrible, how terrible it would be, or it would have been, if Jesus would have refrained from speaking to that woman, if Jesus had not invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, if Jesus had not allowed the prostitute in Simon the Pharisee's house to um, wash his feet with her tears, because he was scared of what people would think and how, uh, what sort of a witness it would be. He did these things, he allowed these things because it was the right thing to do. If society, and dare I say it, the Christian church have got a hang up about it, but that's their problem. That's something for them to sort out. And it would be terrible if people went without blessing, if we could be an agency of that blessing, if we could be a blessing and not be a blessing because of this obsession we have, oh, what will people say? What will people think? What rumours would come out of this now? Jesus didn't care, and neither should we. If people talk, if people gossip, if malicious tongues wag, let them. If they've got nothing better to do, let them. As somebody once said, at least they're leaving somebody else alone. So let's not apply too much holiness to ourselves that Jesus wouldn't have applied to himself. And let's not apply rules to ourselves that Jesus regarded as acceptable. So secondly, firstly, fill. Fill, if you like, obedience. Obedience in the face of something that just didn't make sense. Fill the water jars. And they did so to the brim. Secondly, draw. That was the second thing Jesus said. Draw. Draw. Now, it's only Jesus that could turn the water into wine. The servants couldn't do that. That's why there was panic. They had run out of wine and there was no other means of getting more wine. The local co-op was on half day and it was impossible to find the owner and there was no chance of getting more wine. Only he could do that. Only he could do that. And as sovereign God, he could do anything. He could defy the laws of nature which he himself put into place. And when he turned the water into wine, now whether that happened, we don't know whether the water was still in the jars or when the servants were carrying the water to the host, we don't really know, but who cares? It turned into wine and Jesus made it happen. And he invites us to draw from his provisions. It's very frustrating, isn't it? Um, the, the water board, for example, um, Welsh water, they will send you a, a letter or a text days before they intend to turn the water off to do some maintenance work. But you forget, don't you? You forget. I do anyway, do you? 
Oh, some of you are much better than me then, but some of you, um, uh, like myself, forget. I mean, turn the tap on, looking forward to that lovely first cup of coffee of the day. And what do you get? A cup of drips. And that's that. Oh, you know? You think there's more than enough water in Wales, and you turn the tap on, and the thing or hardly anything comes out. It's the same with electric, isn't it? On a cold winter's morning, you forget that you've been warned that there'd be a power cut, and nothing works. You want it to be there, but it's not there. You want to draw from the water, to draw from the electricity, to draw from the gas, but for whatever reason, it's not there. Do you have Tesco or Asda or Morrison's deliver for you? Sometimes do you? Yes. Some of you do, some of you don't. And you think, great, you know, don't have to go pushing a trolley around um, uh, for a long time. They bring it to us. But of course, they've got a piece of paper and on that piece of paper it says unavailable, right? Or substitutions, isn't it? And when you have people with allergies in the house, not always are those substitutions, you know, you can't draw. You, you've ordered things, but the wrong things have turned up, or indeed some things haven't turned up at all. Have you had it a couple of times? They haven't turned up at all. Tesco's, once they went to the wrong address and somebody enjoyed our provisions. Can you believe that? How frustrating is that? Well, Jesus invites us to draw from his provisions. He is the vine, we are the branches, and we have the wine of his word. The wine of prayer and the wine of fellowship. Is there anything sweeter than God's word? Is there anything sweeter than being able to talk to God Almighty any time we please, anywhere we may be? Is there anything sweeter than fellowship? with your brothers and sisters in the faith. Sometimes, as I said, the wine was used as medicine. And when that medicine was poured on an open wound, who would stun? Yes, and maybe the medicine didn't appeal to everybody's taste. A bitter taste, maybe. And sometimes God's medicine does sting. Sometimes there's a bitter taste to it. But aren't we told that he disciplines those that he loves? And that's why he disciplines us. But the most important thing, dear friends, is that there is enough provision. We support the food bank because people can't afford the provisions that are available in Tesco's, in Asda, in Morrison's, or wherever. But the provisions that Jesus offers are free. Come, buy without money, without cost, Isaiah tells us in chapter 55 of his book. But those, he continues to say in chapter 40, or he says in chapter 40, Isaiah that is, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Fill, dear friends, be obedient, whether it makes sense or not, fill those jars. Draw 
from the provisions of God, but finally, take. That's what Jesus said. Take it to the master of the banquet. The servants took the wine to the master of the banquet and there was a threefold blessing. And this is what happens, you see, when we take God's provision to others. There are multiple blessings. First of all, Jesus was glorified. Now, don't expect everybody to be delighted by that. When Jesus was glorified, that's when his enemies really went to work. That's when the religious leaders, the Pharisees and people like that, that's when they really rolled their sleeves up and went to work with their vicious tongues and conspiracies. So please don't expect wonderful things, happy things, when Jesus is glorified. Right? You ask the Christians in persecuted countries, nothing glorifies God more than someone coming to faith. But very often, the person God used to bring others to faith, they will suffer terrible things for bringing people to faith and bringing glory to Jesus. But Jesus was glorified. Jesus was glorified. Secondly, the servants who knew about the miracle before anyone, well, they were blessed. Weren't they? What? Fill these jars to the brim? What's the point of that? What will that achieve when we've run out of wine? And what a blessing to them when they saw they had this wonderful wine to give to the master of the banquet. When you think of Jesus, Sometimes he uses the most unexpected of people to do things, doesn't he? That woman, by, and I say that deliberately, that woman, by Jacob's well. How many people came to faith because she shared the good news about the Messiah? Who were the first people to learn? about the resurrection, to see the risen Jesus, Mary Magdalene, wasn't it? Yes, Peter and John saw an empty grave, but Mary saw the risen Jesus before any of the apostles. Saul Tassus, of all people, to be an apostle to Gentiles, to go to fellow Jews and tell them to turn to Christ. And it was these servants, these servants, that first saw the water turned into wine. So the servants were blessed, but not just the servants, and this is the third blessing. Everyone was blessed. Wow! They had the best wine ever. Not just the host and the servants, but every guest there. They had the best wine ever. Dear friends, let's take the gospel and share it with others. It won't return to him empty. There'll be multiple blessings. Maybe we won't see them. Maybe we won't see them. We've just got to trust in God, knowing that he is a gracious God. That's not our business. Um, <coughs> didn't Jesus tell um, Peter in John chapter 1, when Peter said, regarding John, well, what about him? What's that to you? That's my business. You stick to what I've called you to do. Whatever our plans I've got for him is between me 
and him. Let's take, take what we've drawn from his provisions. He has turned our water into wine. Oh, he could do it. Let's draw from his provisions and take. And it will be a blessing to him because he will be glorified. It will be a blessing to us and it will be a blessing to everyone we serve for his glory. Amen. <coughs> well, our final hymn, dear friends, Blessed Assurance. <coughs> Remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.